Imam Hassan alayhi salam is a figure shrouded by the vicissitudes of time and the apparent obscurity of historical accounts. He was the second infallible Imam and the Khalif and leader of the Muslims. Yet the scheming strategies employed by Muawiyah ibn Sufyan have proven to affect the awareness of not only the Muslims of that time, but also the Muslims of today. What is the approach of the Muslim Ummah concerning Imam al Hassan? Who was Imam Hassan and what did he stand for throughout his life? If Muawiyah ibn Sufyan was indeed the enemy of Islam, then why did Imam Hassan sign a peace treaty with him? This is the seminary report. When it comes to the approach of both Sunni and Shia Muslims towards Imam al Hassan, there is very little discourse concerning him. While understandably, the Sunni school of thought does not consider him as an infallible, sinless Imam, the Shia school of thought does. And yet, there is minimal discussion concerning Imam al Hassan, his lifetime, his strategies in observing and maintaining Islam, and his martyrdom. This is due to, number one, historical ambiguities. We do not know clearly what transpired. And number two, the legacy of Imam al Hassan is somewhat overshadowed by that of his father, Imam Ali, before him, and that of his younger brother, Imam Hussein, after him. While the latter two personalities are discussed, celebrated, and mourned a great amount, Imam Hassan, the bridge between these two, often remains neglected. Both of these reasons are due to our own oversight. As for the history, it is clear, but it is the Muslim Ummah which has been unsuccessful in familiarizing itself with the decisive era between the first and the third infallible Imams. Furthermore, it is held by the Shia school of thought that there is no difference between any of the decisions made, acts performed, or words spoken by any of the infallible Imams. All of them are immaculate representatives of the Holy Prophet. The only thing that truly changed was the time and the circumstances in which they lived. Some say that Imam Hassan was the peaceful Imam since he signed a peace treaty with Muawiyah and that Imam Hussein was the revolutionary Imam since he rose up against Yazid. The reality is far from this. If Allah had caused Imam Hussein to be in the position of Imam Hassan, Imam Hussein would have acted exactly the same way as Imam Hassan did and vice versa. So who was Imam Hassan? Imam Hassan السلام, was born in the middle of the month of Ramadan on the third year of Hijrah in Medina. His title is Al Mujtaba. His father was Ali ibn Abi Talib, the first of the twelve Imams and the fourth Khalif, and his mother was Lady Fatima, the daughter of the Holy Prophet himself. According to Shia and Sunni narrators, the Holy Prophet had stated that there would be twelve leaders after him, and emphatically stated that all of these would be from his lineage, the tribe of Quraysh. Furthermore, the Holy Prophet said about his two grandsons that these two, Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein, are Imams, leaders of the Muslim Ummah, whether they take a firm stand against an issue or observe peace. After his father Imam Ali was martyred, the leadership over the Muslim Ummah was passed on to Imam Hassan on the 21st of Ramadan. People welcomed the offer of allegiance and soon became the followers of such a respectable leader. Thus, for a brief moment, the cesspool of highly opinionated and quarrelling factions within the bustling city of Kufa in Iraq were united under the banner of righteousness. Imam Hassan stated, I can accept your allegiance on the condition that you will fight with one whom I fight with and that you make peace with one whom I make peace with. The masses in large numbers vowed to follow him and immediately started to pay allegiance to him as the true Islamic Khalif. But there was a thorn in the side of the Ummah at this pivotal moment in Islamic history, Muawiyah from the tribe of Bani Umayyah. After being defeated diplomatically, Muawiyah decided to take up arms and planned for a large-scale attack on Iraq. And Imam Hassan swiftly came to the defense of the Islamic government, ordering his governors to prepare for defensive strategies. But the Muslims of Kufa, at this precarious juncture in history, when they ought to have been full of zeal and valor, coming to the aid of the Imam and the Khalif of their time, were instead still. Years of civil wars and battles, not only against Muawiyah, but also against groups like the Khawarij, had worn them down and tired them out. Thus, Imam Hassan found himself cornered. 
he delivered a sermon to his people saying, Beware, Muawiyah has made us such an offer, which is neither respectful nor is it based on justice. So if you decide to fight till death, then we will again attack Muawiyah and force him by the might of the sword to turn to the right path as commanded by Almighty God. But if you choose worldly life, then we will accept his offer and get protection for you. Hearing this, the cry of life, life was heard from all directions. In order to understand the flaws in the faction that claimed to follow Imam Hassan, it is necessary for us to investigate the various groups within the society and government of Imam Hassan. The Muslims in Imam Hassan's faction consisted of four main groups. The first was his Shia. These were devoted to Imam Hassan. Their motives were based on faith. These people considered Khilafat as the right of the Ahlul Bayt. They considered obedience to the Ahlul Bayt and to the Holy Prophet as obligatory. But many of these had been martyred fighting in the time of Imam Ali for the sake of justice and very few of these now remained. Then there were the supporters of tribalism. The Arab society at the time was based on tribalism. The war was also fought in accordance with this system. Most of the army of Imam Hassan was composed of such persons who would only accept the order of their tribal or party leader. In other words, big decisions like going to war were in the hands of the tribal chiefs, not in the hands of Islam and the other members of a particular tribe would follow their tribal leader, not the Imam. In such circumstances, there was always a possibility that such tribal leaders could force the majority of the army of Imam Hassan to leave at the drop of a hat. Then there was the group of self-seekers. Many nationalities from different areas belonging to different families, colors, breeds, religions and tribes had settled in Kufa, Iraq. These were they who wanted to gain worldly benefits through war. For them, military ranks and booty were the main attraction, and they were not concerned whether the war was being fought for a just cause or for falsehood. These had no love for religion or moral values. Then there were the Khawarij. Outwardly, these people were pious and very respectable, but they lacked insight and wisdom. While one of their objectives was indeed to kill Muawiyah, they also had been behind the assassination of Imam Ali, whom they referred to, God forbid, as a polytheist. In other words, very much like Daesh today, they were neither here nor there and were a vicious sporadic group. Their numbers after their defeat in the Battle of Nahrawan could not be considered as large, but their group constituted a significant threat to the army of Imam Hassan and the Muslim Ummah at large. While Imam Hassan had proven to show the very same valour, will, determination, foresight and faith of his father and his grandfather before him, it was the people, the Muslim Ummah, who were exhausted, faithless, disunited and lacked foresight. Imam Hassan, due to the weak will and the lack of fortitude of the Ummah, saw it prudent to make a peace treaty with Muawiyah. The seven terms of the treaty were, number one, Imam Hassan would hand over the rulership to Muawiyah provided that Muawiyah acts according to the Holy Book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Holy Prophet. Number two, the life, property and honour of the general public, regardless of race, nationality or creed, would be safeguarded. Number three, the life, property and honour of the Shias of Imam Ali and their family members would be protected. Number four, Muawiyah would hand over the public funds of Kufa and the revenue of Darabud Jard to Imam Hassan in order to repay debts and other dues. Number five, Imam Ali would be remembered with honor and dignity and he would not be abused or cursed. This was a vital part of the treaty as previously Muawiyah had promoted the cursing and abusing of Imam Ali from pulpits across the Ummah, misguiding the masses. Number six, Muawiyah would not have the right to nominate a Khalif after him. This condition was necessary in order to rule out any chances of Muawiyah choosing his son Yazid to be the Khalif after him. For while Muawiyah may have at least outwardly preserved the apparent garb of Islam in the Ummah, Yazid was an open alcoholic and a flagrantly immoral character. Even with Muawiyah as the Khalif, Islam still stood a chance of survival, but if the Ummah were to ever fall into the hands of Yazid, Islam would be obliterated totally.
and number seven. Muawiyah would not take any open or secret action against Imam Hassan or against the Ahlul Bayt, the progeny of the Holy Prophet, and he would not try to terrorize them anywhere on earth. But Muawiyah, loyal only to his own treacherous tactics, would not remain faithful to this treaty. On the 27th of Safar, 49 Hijri, Imam Hassan was poisoned and martyred by order of Muawiyah through his wife in Medina. Imam Hassan was martyred at the age of approximately 47 years. Imam Hassan is buried in Jannatul Baqi, situated in Medina. The tomb which had been erected in this holy sanctuary, in memory of this great man, was destroyed by the Wahhabi Saudi Alliance in 1806 and 1925. Some of the sayings of Imam Hassan are, there is no poverty like ignorance, and brotherhood is loyalty in hardship and comfort.